Hello, it's Scott Manley here and we astronomy fans are excited because it's less than 48 hours until the New Horizons spacecraft flies past a tiny speck of dirt in the outer solar system, which has been nicknamed Ultima Thule, from the Latin for the most northerly point. Uh, now this object, that's a nickname for it, it's actually called 2014 MU69 because it was discovered in 19, sorry, 2014. So uh, yeah, this tiny body is about 20 to 40 kilometers across and it's out in the outer edge of the solar system in a region called the Kuiper Belt, named for Ger Girl Kuiper who came up, came up with the idea that there might be remains of planets in the outer solar system. Now it's so far and so small and so faint that it was only discovered using the Hubble Space Telescope. And originally when New Horizons was uh, being planned and when it was launched, there was plans for it to find targets of opportunity after flying by Pluto. However, when it was launched, they didn't know of any such object and they began looking for them. They actually began looking in 2004. They started using the Subaru telescope in Hawaii and they, they didn't find anything and you know they continued looking they also tried using the Canada France Hawaii telescope and uh, the Magellan telescope but none of those were able to find it and the reason is that New Horizon is headed into a very busy patch of the sky it's very close to the plane of the galaxy and actually very close to where the general direction of the core of the galaxy so not only was it uh, trying to find this very faint object, but the field was populated by huge numbers of stars that had to be removed. And even after trying to remove them, they were coming up blank. The team involved did finally get uh, allowed to use the Hubble Space Telescope, but they had to prove that they would be able to find these objects. So it was like a crash couple of weeks, which Alex Parker has a great thread on Twitter explaining this. In fact, I'm using probably several of his diagrams because it's a great summary of what you have to go through to find these things. And yeah, with the two weeks work, they developed new software. They used something called synthetic tracking, where you say that you're looking for an object on a specific orbit. So let's imagine that it's moving in that orbit and then stack your photos taken at different times so that they all line up with this specific, uh, with this specific orbit. So yeah, the Hubble Space Telescope, because it was in space, it meant sharper images. The sharper images made smaller stars and the smaller stars meant it was possible to see this very tiny faint object. During this whole survey, they discovered a whole bunch of other objects out here. In fact, if you look at uh, this map, you can actually see there's this line of objects that are potentially along uh, New Horizons trajectory because that was the point in the sky that they were looking. They obviously, you know, you can look anywhere to find these objects, but if you're focusing on one very small area, you're going to find a lot there. They did find multiple objects. They came up with three candidate objects, but MU69 became the best option owing to it being the right size and requiring low levels of Delta V because, of course, New Horizons was didn't have much fuel left, but it had enough to correct its trajectory, so it would fly past at about 3,500 kilometers. And as of right now, New Horizons is expected to fly by Ultima Thule at a speed of 14 kilometers per second at a range of about 3,500 kilometers at, well, on the 1st of January at 5.33 a.m. Universal Standard Time. And, you know, there's a bit of uncertainty in this close approach distance. I mean, we really don't know much about this object at all. And that even comes down to the position. The position is quite uncertain because it's so far out and our parallax is so low that it could be, you know, a few hundred kilometers in or out of our, exact, our estimated position. And this is, uh, this is important. Maybe not a few hundred kilometers, but it's definitely not well known. O on the way in, they've been trying to find out... Um, for example, the rotation of the object. So what you do is you look and see if there's any variations in the brightness. No variation was observed with Hubble. They then used the LORI imager, that's the long range reconnaissance imager, to see if they could see any light curve on it. They didn't find any evidence of that there, which is really interesting because when uh, they did get some idea of the geometry, it looks like a double lobed object. Now to get the shape of an object that is so far out, you can't just take an image because of course the resolution is too low, it's literally a point in the sky. What astronomers did was they waited for it to pass in front of a background star. 
And then they set up a string of telescopes on the surface of the Earth, running north to south, so that as the shadow swept across the Earth, they would get different bits of the shadow. And you know the star would go out for a second and then come back. And depending upon the time when this happened, they got an idea of this, and you can see that it looks a bit like a two-lobe dumbbell. It could be something completely different. It could be bean-shaped. We will find out, obviously, in a few days when we get the actual data back. Now, the other thing that they didn't find any evidence for, which is a good thing, was satellites or rings. If they had found anything that was even slightly suspicious, they would have made a trajectory correction manoeuvre about 10 days ago to push the close approach further out. So they wouldn't have got as high a resolution, but they would have reduced the chance of the spacecraft hitting anything and losing all the data together. Uh, its orbit is, what's, is about 45 AU out, and it's a very low inclination, low eccentricity. And this puts it in a class of objects called the cold classical Kuiper belt. And when we say cold, yes, it's very cold out there because the sun is so faint, but what they're meaning is it's dynamically cold. There are hot objects that have had their orbits disturbed and kicked up by uh, gravitational interactions with other planets, and we see these objects in various places. So the cold classical Kuiper belt just refers to those objects with low inclinations and low eccentricities. And this is important because it means that the object has been sitting in this orbit for about four and a half billion years since the Sun formed. It hasn't come in close to the Sun, so it hasn't been altered. This is probably the most pristine object that we have, we're ever going to see for a long time, because if you compare, say, Rosetta, that's been an object that's been coming in and getting heated by the Sun. Pluto is large enough that it's, you know, it turned into a sphere and the heat released would have changed the uh, structure of Pluto. So this is really a pristine example of early solar system planetesimals. Anyway, look, we're not going to see very much from the spacecraft during the encounter, partly because, yes, there's a six hour flight time lag, uh, but also because the spacecraft is just going to be doing science during the close approach. If you were to sit on the spacecraft, uh, then Ultima Thule would see to your eyes, it would be roughly the size of the moon in the sky over the Earth, but it would be moving about a hundred times faster than uh, you know it appears. The moon appears to move across our sky. It would also be significantly fainter because the sun is about two thousand times fainter at that distance. Um, so yeah, uh, the good news, of course, is that spacecraft's cameras aren't like our crappy smartphones. No, they are super high quality telescopes that are able to get very detailed images from a long way out. At 3,500 kilometers, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, or LORI, will in theory have a resolution of about 30 kilometers per pixel. At that distance, of course, they are going to have to contend with the fact that the spacecraft or the camera is going to have to slew to track the object, otherwise it'll get motion blur. This will have to be something they have to contend with. There's also another camera on board called MVIC, the Multispectral Visible Imaging Camera. That doesn't have as good a resolution, but it does see in color, so we'll be getting a few images from that. Now, the first images we will get back are what are called fail-safe images. That is, it's flying in just in case anything goes wrong, it's going to downlink uh, an image 34 hours beforehand. And it's going to take like three to four hours to do this. At this distance, the lorry resolution will be about eight kilometers per pixel. So the object is expected to be three or four pixels across. That's just enough to get an idea of the approximate shape. Uh, the second fail-safe download happens about 19 hours before a close approach. Again, takes about three to four hours. That'll give us pixel resolutions of about, uh, um, you know, five kilometers per pixel, so five to seven kilometer, you know, pixels across. They'll also download data from other instruments such as ALICE, SWAP, Pepsi, SDC. You can go and look all this up, but suffice to say they're collecting more than just images as they fly past. They're collecting magnetometer and plasma and ultraviolet spectra, all that stuff, because, you know, uh, science is done far beyond the human's visible spectrum. And after those fail-safe images are sent, New Horizons will spend the next 24 hours sciencing the heck out of Ultima Thule. It'll wait until about four hours after the encounter before it sends anything back, and that will just be a phone home to say that it's alive and tell the spacecraft is healthy. 
Uh, to send actual science data, that'll wait until eight and a half hours post encounter. Then it will download a single image from the lorry camera. It should be, uh, it should take about three hours. And it'll be about 300 meters per pixel. Uh, and Ultima Tula should appear to be about, um, you know, 100 pixels across which is you know exactly what media outlets want it's a nice picture you can put on your front page or in a, an article and that's why alan stern calls these first images sent back the nyt downlinks a second nyt downlink happens a few hours later and that takes almost seven hours to deliver a 140 meters per pixel image and in theory uh, ultima Tula will be about um, 200 pixels across if it's in the frame, because of course, positional uncertainty could mean that it's actually outside the frame of the camera in this case. They're also gonna take a 900 meter per pixel color image using MVIC. And uh, yeah, there'll also be data from uh, various other instruments downlinked at about the same time, because this will be the batch of data that gets given to the scientists. And then they have 12 hours to figure out what they can talk about because the first press conference is expected to happen at 7 p.m. Universal Time on January the 2nd. And that will be data fresh off the presses. You know, hopefully this will be awesome because, you know, Kuiper Belt objects, there are such a large population out there that we can barely see. There's also the most pristine part of the solar system, as I've described. So yeah, getting to, getting this data down will be big news for me. I've obviously been interested in these small bodies for a very long time. In fact, I was in Ireland, so we didn't call it the Kuiper Belt. We called it the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt because there was an Irish guy called Kenneth Edgeworth who predicted it before Kuiper. And not only that, Kuiper said that the, uh, that the belt would have been long swept clear by gravitational effects, whereas, um, you know, Edgeworth, he thought that the belt would still be there. So, of course, you know, being uh, Scottish, being Celtic, being Irish or whatever, we, uh, <laughs> we all preferred to give credit to our local individual. But yes, that's what's going on. Uh, hope that New Horizons does its business and hopefully that we get some great pictures over the next few days. And, oh yeah, even post this, of course, that's the just the first images. During the whole encounter, they're expecting to get about six and a half gigabytes of data from this. So for comparison, Pluto, they got about eight gigabytes. It'll take about 20 months to download all that data from New Horizons. And then, well, New Horizons will continue. It still has power. It has this uh, you know, radioisotope thermoelectric power generator on board, but it won't have any targets. And it's very unlikely that we'll find anything else that is in the right part of space that is visible by its uh, very small fuel supply. So maybe it takes another, you know, family portrait of the solar system and then goes to sleep. Maybe it just continues. It's probably not gonna uh, hit the edge of the solar system before its fuel or its electrical power runs out because it's not going as fast as the Voyager spacecraft. And of course, you know, if you wanna see where it is in a thousand years time, you can, uh, load up Elite Dangerous and jump in your ASP Explorer and fly out to the edge of the solar system. It's a lot easier to find now in the, the latest update to the game. So yes, uh, New Horizons, best of luck, fly safe.